hearing, I want to start the graduate curriculum meeting, and we are going to start this morning with our guest consultant, Dr. Barbara Turner. Some of you know um, Barbara from her visits to us in the past when she was very influential in helping us get going with HRSA grants. In fact, we were talking about it at breakfast this morning, and she was saying, I know I helped somebody. Who was it? And I said, Carol Palafroni, and you'll get to see her later on today. So we're uh, we're grateful that she's here with us. There have been some questions about why now and why Barbara Turner. So I wanted to explain to you the impetus behind that. Um, I think I did probably not as much detail in the email that I sent out about having um, a consultant come in. This year, AACN put out a white paper on scholarship in the DNP program. And in that white paper, they made several recommendations that we are not in compliance with. And while it, they are recommendations, they are far more specific than they ever have been before about what scholarship should look like in the DNP program. So when I read this and talked to others in the school about this, I felt very strongly that we needed to have some consultation on what are others throughout the country thinking about, what is in this, these documents. Um, so this is a, cons a consultation visit that is designed to start a discussion that will continue throughout the year as to what's happening with DNP education throughout the country. Um, Barbara serves as a consultant to several large states throughout the US um, <coughs> who have DNP programs. And uh, some of the DNP programs that she has consulted with actually do have the doctoral, the, the DNP awarded by the graduate school. So she does have experience <coughs> in, uh, in that. And why specifically Barbara? Well, several reasons. First of all, we know her from the past and have had uh, great experience with consultation from her, but more importantly, um, sh her expertise with uh, the Duke DNP program, uh, their program is very much focused on quality improvement and the things that DNPs should be prepared to do. So I felt that she would be, uh, she was recommended to me by one of the one of the people on the faculty and I felt that looking at the curriculum and looking at her experience uh, throughout the United States that she could begin to start the discussion about what we might do with our DNP program. Now, as you know, we were accredited by the um, CCNE last year for the full five years, which is as much as they give a new program. <clears throat> so we're, we're in great shape, and this is when you look at your curriculum, is when you're coming from a position of strength. In between, this is a very typical time to really be examining what's happening um, with the curriculum in a DNP program. And so I want to make it very clear that this is a consultation visit for us to learn about what's happening in other places and what she sees as the impact of the AACN uh, white paper on the scholarship in the DNP program. Of course, I'm sure we'll hear a lot more about this at the conference in Florida, the doctoral conference there, so we'll get some more guidance about what people are thinking <laughs> about the direction of DNP education. We were fairly early adopters of the DNP, and so I think it's important for us to be fairly early examiners of what, is the, what the new recommendations would be. And I also, since this is our first opportunity to be together, I want to thank Sandy Bellini for her leadership of the DNP program. Uh, she came here to start the program and has been so influential in creating a really excellent program where we have been recognized nationally, often presenting at different conferences, both nationally and internationally, publishing about what we have done in creating the DNP program. And now we're moving into a new era, and Joy Elwell will be leading the DNP program going forward as Sandy focuses much more on the further development of our uh, online NNP program. So I'm really grateful to both of them, first for previous leadership and now for uh, new leadership as we examine where we would like to go with the DNP degree. So with all, all, all of that, I'm going to turn it over to Barbara so she can start the discussion about what we should be thinking about in our DNP program. Thank you very much. Can you hear me in the back? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm getting over. I was in China and I got the China crud. So I'm getting over that. Yeah, she's prepared me for what that's going to be like when I go there. <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's just really great. Um, <laughs> okay, so how do I make this? Oh, oh, I see what I'm doing. Okay, hold on. Um, this is what I'd like to talk about today is an overview of DNP program. I'm going to talk about our program, but I'm also going to talk about programs that I've um, helped review across the country. And I'm going to focus some attention on the DNP project 
It used to be called the Capstone Project, and now that verbiage has gone away. Um, and it's called the DNP Project, the DNP Scholars Project. And then I'm going to end it just with um, some things that we've done in online education. I'm sure I could learn much more from you, but some things we've done and some mistakes we've made in our online education program. But <coughs> excuse me. So what's the DNP? You all know this. It's a Doctor of Nursing practice. It's not a research degree. So when you have students that come in and say, you know, I really want a doctoral degree, how do you help them figure out, is it a PhD they want or is it a DNP? And when I'm talking to students, I say, where is the fire in your belly? Is the fire in your belly for practice or is the fire in your belly for research? And once they really think about that, and is the fire in your belly for staying in clinical practice or is the fire in your belly for leaving clinical practice? Um, when they think about that, it's fairly easy for them to figure out which route they want to go on. At our school, only two people have mischosen. One chose the PhD, changed her mind, and came to the DNP. One was in the DNP, changed her mind, and went to the PhD. So, so far, we're, we're fairly good about triaging them to the right program. To the right program. These were, maybe, I'm probably older than all of you combined, but this is what we had to do if we wanted a doctorate. These were our options. We did a BSN, then we did an MSN, and then we did a PhD. And of course you had to have practice in between each one. You could never go straight through because that was not the conventional thinking. But these days, oh my gosh, the opportunities are amazing. So you can start with a BSN or an accelerated BSN that's very popular, and you can go straight into the master's degree, or you can go straight into the DNP or straight into the PhD, and any combination thereof. What's been interesting in our program is that currently in our DNP program, we have five PhD prepared students. And you sort of say, well, what happened? Did you just want a second doctorate? And what they said was they chose, and the DNP was not available when they did their doctorate, it was only the PhD, and they really wanted to know quality improvement and process improvement and how to make change in the clinical setting. And they did not learn that in their PhD program, thus they came back for a DNP program. We have had no DNPs that have gone on to get a PhD, but we've only been doing the DNP program for eight years, so they still could at some other time do that. So who is the DNP degree designed for? Masters prepared clinicians, administrators, including informatics, uh, as well as clinicians who want to teach clinical nursing. It's great for them. It's not designed for researchers. So we have been very clear with everyone that comes into our program, this is not a research doctorate. We are not preparing you to be research. The methodologies we teach you will not be research methodologies. And we've also been clear, and this is where we've gotten a lot of pushback, it's not for nurses with a master's in education. A lot of our students and students across the country who have a master's in nursing education want to come into the DNP program, and we keep asking CCNE and AACN, you know, what is your stance on that? And finally, the white paper came out and said it is not for those who have a master's in education. Why was it developed? I don't think I need to tell you this. Certainly, the Institute of Medicine reports, AACN recommendations. National Academy of Science is the one that said nursing would be well served if you did a practice doctorate like the other disciplines. And it's clear that our students and our nurses that are practicing um, need new tools and a new skill set to meet the needs of healthcare um, today. And of course it's in line with other healthcare disciplines who award the doctoral degree, the practice doctorate, MDs, PharmDs, dentists, um, and physical therapy as an example. RAND came out with a report um, just about a year ago now, and they found that there was a near universal agreement among nursing academic leaders that the DNP was a valuable education for advanced practice nurses. In, contra uh, and in accordance with that, they found that the student demand for the DNP is strong, and I'll talk about that in a minute. The problem is, and I don't know if that's a problem up here, many employers are unclear what does the DNP degree add and how is it different than a, um, 
nurse with a master's degree. And I actually had to go before the North Carolina Board of Medicine because we were the first DNP program in the state to try to explain to them that this is not an additional certification, um, that, that this is an academic degree. And what was interesting was when I went over the curriculum with the North Carolina Board of Medicine and they saw what we were teaching them, they said, you know what, we could use that too. That's information that would be very helpful to us as physicians. So it was fine after that. Um, we know nationally that NPs with a DNP degree earn about $8,700 more than a master's prepared um, NP. Now, I don't know what your tuition is, but our tuition is somewhere around $63,000. So the payback for the DNP is something that you really have to take into consideration about how long it will take you to pay off your loan versus the amount of extra income that you get. But our students aren't doing it for money. And they will tell us that. They have no idea if they're going to get more money or not. But what they do say is, I really need those skills, those quality improvement, evidence-based practice skills, because I don't have those. So what's the difference between the PhD and the DNP? Both are terminal degrees, and I tell our students that. And then they say, oh, so we're going to die? I mean, that's sort of the way they think of it. Um, but no, they're terminal, they're highest degrees. PhD, Knowledge, Discovery, and Dissemination. You're a professional researcher, that's your job. Where the DNP, you're worried about the identification, evaluation, translation, and application of research findings to the practice setting to improve the healthcare outcomes, and you're a researching professional. This is the way I think about it, and this is the way I explain it to our students, the sort of research practice cycle. The top part is the PhD, and the bottom part is the DNP. So the PhDs are prepared to identify questions, conduct the research, and disseminate the findings. And that's all I was ever trained to do. But the DNP is the bottom half of the circle. They're evaluating the evidence for application to practice. They're implementing change as appropriate. They're evaluating the outcomes of the practice change, and they're disseminating findings. What's important here is that dissemination is important for both degrees, both the DNP and the PhD. And the nurses, uh, the nurses that are in our program, we have to set them up for success in dissemination. And I will talk a little bit more about that. But these skills on the bottom half of the circle are really important that they get those down cold. Because that's what they're going to be doing in their clinical setting. They're going to be evaluating the evidence, seeing if they should implement change. They need to know how to implement change in a practice setting, including the barriers and the facilitators. Um, and strategies, financial analysis, and all that. They need to be able to evaluate the outcomes and then um, disseminate the findings. Posters, presentations, whatever. So are there DNP programs outside the United States? No, not that I know of. At least I haven't heard of any. But a lot of international students are coming into DNP programs in the United States, which we find interesting. Pacific, uh, for us, specifically Asian women. Although I have students from the S's. Let me see, Switzerland, Spain, Singapore, and Saudi Arabia, as well as Canada and a few other places, China, a few other places. Um, this is a more natural fit for many of them because they are chief nurses or nurse leaderships in organizations um, outside the United States. In the United States, what's the enrollment? Uh, the DMPs is a fairly young program compared to the PhD, but it, there are almost twice as many DNP programs as PhD programs in the United States. And look at the enrollment, almost three times as many people enrolled in DNP programs as PhD programs. There was great concern that with the initiation of the DNP, there would be a drop off in applicants for the PhD program. That has not happened. There's actually been a 1% rise in the number of PhD students. So that was the good news. We were not stealing. DNP was not stealing from the PhD. I'm going to talk a little bit about our uh, DNP. We have two entry points. I think you do also. The post-baccalaureate and the post-MSA. <coughs> the post-baccalaureate for us is the most problematic um, simply because they're projects. They're not advanced practice nurses when they, um, they're not, they, they are not advanced practice nurses when they start their projects. So we have more difficulty with them. The post-MSN to DNP is 
very slick and smooth, no problems with that. Our postmasters is five semesters, two to three courses a semester offered online. The public domain products that you uh, leave with when you leave our pro uh, program is certainly a manuscript that must be submitted to the journal. You cannot graduate unless we have a receipt from the journal saying that the manuscript was submitted. Um, the students all get an op-ed uh, in their local papers. Um, it's been very interesting that they do get published. Almost 100% get their op-ed posted in their local paper, and that has to do with their policy course. The students also have to do a briefing paper for the state representative or his or her um, legislative associate. And the students also do a YouTube patient education video as part of the coursework. So those are the things that are in the public domain that the nurses do. <coughs> Our curriculum, like yours, is online, can be taken anywhere in the world. Um, we do have executive campus sessions. Um, I think we have more than you do, because we do once a semester they come in for um, on-campus sessions. And students, 100% of our students work full-time, and they typically take two to three um, courses per semester. So I'm going to give you what a, sort of a student view of the program. <coughs> We have a required three-day orientation on campus. I think you have something in August also. I end up being the advisor to all students that come in. And we admit about um, 75 in the fall and about 25 in the spring. I bring them all to my house for dinner. And they have told me that that is the most valuable part of the three-day orientation period because they get to see each other as real people, not as competitors um, in the classroom. And we spend a lot of time just getting to know you over at my house. We also give the message that competition starts, stops at matriculation. And cooperation starts at matriculation. So you are competitive to get into the program. But from now on, you have to be in a cooperative mode. And it isn't uh, a one-upsmanship or I'm smarter or I get higher grades than you because of the way they have to work when they get out. They're, in the fall, they're taking an online uh, stats and evidence-based practice course. Everything is focused to the uh, DNP Scholarly Project. All work in the program is focused to the DNP Scholarly Project. They come back on campus in October, <clears throat> and so students that have to fly in from Chicago will complain that it's an hour and a half flight to get here. And I was just here in August, but the people from Singapore spend 30 hours getting there. So, you know, my tolerance for whining at that is pretty low. Um, on campus in October, they present their re review of the literature to their small group, and the review of the literature is on what they think they're going to do their process improvement or quality improvement project on. And they also present a stats critique of articles to make sure that they know what they're looking at when they're critiquing articles. We have a lot of wine and cheese networking with faculty. And at this point in October is when they typically choose who is going to be the advisor for their DMP project. <coughs> so we get them all together and we get all the faculty together to wine and cheese. The students will talk about their interest and the faculty will talk about their interest. And there's a lot of, not speed dating, but you know, matching up at that point in time in which they um, decide that they're going to um, sort of cooperate further and see if it will work, because in January, we'd like them to have an advisor for their DNP project. At the end of the first semester, they have their peak, oh, sir. Hi, how many, how many DNP faculty do you have then? It sounds like you have about a, up to 100 students in a cohort, 75 to 25. Mm -hmm. How many DNP faculty do you have? Well, they don't have to be DNP faculty. It's faculty oh, the gotcha. entire school. So they're doctorally prepared faculty, and we have about 94. Okay. So any of, any of them could be Correct. Uh, advisors. Correct. And actually, they really like DNP students. So whether you're PhD or DNP, people really want DNP students because they know at the end they're going to get an article out of it which is very helpful. Yeah. And I'll tell you what the other inducement is, although I shouldn't say that Virginia's sitting here because that might make everybody, might make her nervous. But anyway, mm -hmm. I'll tell you the other inducement we give for that. So yes, so we have a lot of faculty. We have more faculty than we need to handle DNP projects. And the average faculty is handling probably two as a, as a chair of the scholarship project. Um, they can have more than that. But the I other say, inducement is money. Could you mention <laughs> I am going to mention that. So just hang on. <laughs> and it is money. 
Um, so at the end of the fall, I know, I said, I'm sorry you're sitting here, you're not going to be happy with this. So at the end of the fall semester, they've got the PICO question, they sort of figured out who their um, chair of their DNP project would be, and they're ready to move, they're ready to move on. Um, so second semester, they take evidence-based practice two, which is really quality improvement, process improvement. How are they actually going to, given the topic they've got, how are they actually going to implement it in their practice setting? Now, our students all implement the project in their own practice setting, because who better to know about their practice setting? Other schools across the nation vary in that, I will tell you. Some specifically want them to do it in their practice setting. Others specifically bar them from doing it in their practice setting. And the reason we have them do it in their practice setting is, one, they know their practice setting, they know the people in their practice setting, and they know to have, how to get things done in their practice setting, and they're going to be doing it again. This won't be their only project. But there is variation across the country about that. So in their second evidence-based uh, practice course, they're working on the project details. They also interview stakeholders in the setting. What would, it be, what would it mean if I tried to implement this project? What are the barriers to doing it? Who do I need to see? What committees do I need to get approval from? And that has been very helpful because interviewing the stakeholders has stopped certain projects. It's like this will not be done in this institution. You do not have, this will never be done in this institution because of other kinds of things. So then they have to go on to a different kind of a project. <coughs> they take a course in finance. Because students will tell you, there's no cost to this project. <laughs> Come on, there is a cost to the project. It's either in real money or it's in time, effort, or other kinds of resources. So they've all taken a finance course to be able to look at um, the financial um, analysis and financial implications of different kinds of practice. On, when they're on campus that semester, which is, we're now in the spring semester, so they're on campus in February. They do a presentation to their student group about what they're planning to do, their implementation, what they're planning to do their, their scholarly project on. And their capstone advisor is typically at that presentation. And then they get lots of feedback from the student group they're with and from their preceptor. Again, we have wine in conversation. But this wine in conversation is with PhD students. Because now the DNP students have got a semester under their belt, the PhD students have a semester under the belt, so now they begin talking back and forth uh, about their programs. Sometimes it's a I work harder than you work kind of a situation, but other times it's really, oh, my research is in this area, that's what you're doing in practice, maybe I need to rethink what I'm doing. We found it to be very helpful. And our PhD program is on campus and our DNP program is online, so there's few opportunities for them to get together. Third semester, they're taking a leadership course and they learn how to do data mining using their own databases in their organization. So they get permission to get into one of their databases and are answering different kinds of questions. So they're used to their databases in their organization. If they work <coughs> in a small clinic and don't have a database, we give them a database to work. And they continue with the DNP project. The DNP project I'm going to talk about separately. Fourth semester, they take a health policy course, and they get a choice of whether they want to go to D.C. or they want to stay in North Carolina. And if they go to D.C., they meet with their representative. The appointment is made ahead of time. They meet with their representative, and they present a briefing paper to the representative or to the <coughs> legislative aide. That's probably the scariest thing you can ask a nurse to do. Because when you're presenting to um, your representatives or their legislative aides, they don't care about stats. This is what I work. <clears throat> they care about human interest stories um, backed up by stats. So it's a very different kind of briefing that they have to do. If they come to the North Carolina cohort, then they go to the State House uh, in North Carolina and they present an issue to people there. So that was a problem for our international students. They didn't understand health policy in the United States. Um, so we now have them take comparative health care system course, um, which has been a great elective for our other students too. They also take a graduate elective. It can be at Duke or it can be elsewhere. Typically the graduate electives um, that they like to take are health disparities. 
And the other one is we have a quality improvement course. That what is Six Sigma? What is all? What is all that kind of um, different things? And they like to take that course too. And by this time, they're implementing their uh, project. The fifth semester is how do you make change within your own healthcare system? And they have some projects associated with that. Another elective, and then they finish up their DNP project. Okay, so now. This is a presentation I give to students and to faculty. It's called, What Have I Gotten Myself Into? The DMP Scholarly Project. Um, and I'm going to present it. This may seem complicated, um, but I just need to tell you it works really well. So the DMP project must be a process improvement project at a clinical site. You must do some sort of practice change at the site. You have to identify the problem. Review the synthesis of the literature, they've done that in class. Um, the site assessment for readiness of change, they've done that in class. The plan for process improvement, they've done that. And they have to implement the project, evaluate the project, and then they have to write a manuscript for publication. So the goal is to identify a clinical problem area and identify a potential chairperson, which must be Duke faculty. So Duke faculty is the chairperson of their committee. In the second semester, they're finalizing their topic, finalizing the Doosan faculty, Duke University School of Nursing faculty chairperson, and they find two other doctorally prepared committee members, one of, which, one of which must be from the practice site, because we need someone at the practice site that will help them implement this uh, project or strategize with them about how to get over barriers. And we do have non-doctorally prepared people on the committee. Um, if you need a content expert for some reason, a nutritionist is some of them. Um, they do prepare an abstract. And so this, you'll see here, the abstract is submitted to the project committee for approval. That's the team of three. They say the abstract looks OK. But when they submit it to the DNP program committee, and why in the world would you do that? If your committee says it's okay, why would you submit it to the DNP committee for approval? And we did that initially because we were worried about the scope, breadth, and um, depth of the project. That someone would be doing something very, very easy and someone would do, be solving all the problems of the world. So this way, it sort of evens the playing field. And when the committee gets the abstract, They'll say, oh, this is too big a project, try to narrow it down. Or someone has a very small project, they try to say, make it slightly larger. I have wondered and I have asked the committee, have we, we've now that we've had 180 some graduates, are we ready to move on from this? And as of last week, they were not ready to move on from that. They still wanted to be able to look at the abstracts to make sure that they were consistent with what the DNP program uh, committee wanted. So we make the committee members sign agreements to serve. In other words, I agree that I will be part of the student's um, DNP scholarly project. I understand it's going to take about this many hours over a two-year period. And whoever the chair is becomes the student advisor. Remember, they're all my advisees, so I am really happy when they get a chair because it moves <laughs> them on to somebody else. Um, we turn over the file. Um, the student develops the abstract, it's review and approved, I went over that, and it's sent to the committee. <clears throat> In the third semester, they're developing a proposal. And we have the proposal guidelines on our, um, we have a DNP Commons, everything the student needs is on our website, and we call it the DNP Commons. And the proposal is really, if you think about it, the first draft of their manuscript, minus the, obviously the um, results section. So they develop a proposal, and then they defend the proposal to the committee, and that's a defense that's done, oh, it's done um, to the committee over the phone or in person or Skype or WebEx or whatever we happen to have. <coughs> uh, if it's successful, they notify the program administrator, and then they do the IRB application. So here's where things got sticky in the beginning. So they upload their abstract to the IRB, and then the IRB would review it. And the IRB comes with a research hat, right? They think everything is research. No matter if it looks like a zebra, it's still research. So it was taking six weeks to a month to get these approved. How long's your IRB? 
About the same? Okay. About the same. So we went over and talked to the IRB and said, look, this is what this is. These are quality improvement, process improvement projects. These are not research. And the IRB said, could the students, when they submit the application on their abstract, could they have the first few words say, this is a DNP, quality improvement, process improvement project. We said, sure, we can do that. So that's the opening sentence on it. And then the IRB said, well, I'll tell you what, send all proposals to this committee. We have eight IRBs that meet weekly. Send them to this committee in the IRB. And we did that. And so our turnaround time um, dropped from six weeks to guess what? Two, two days. weeks? Two days. Less than 24 hours. Less than 24 hours. So that was a huge thing on our part. But it meant working with the IRB so they understood quality improvement or process improvement projects. And it requires some work on our part, too, that they're not collecting identifiable information or the information is not, that's identifiable is not provided to the student. So that streamlined things hugely to do that. In the third and fourth semester, they're implementing the project. So everybody has to implement a process improvement, quality improvement project. In the fifth and sixth semester, they're evaluating it, including the analysis. So our students are taught SPSS, and they've done data mining, and they have a stats course where they're doing analysis. But you know what? Five semesters later, they've totally forgotten. Totally forgotten. So we have a statistician just for DNP students. The students um, enter it into the database. They do what they think is the right analysis, but the statistician helps them with that. The next bullet, writing of the manuscript. I bet your students are different than ours. I bet your students can write. <laughs> our, students can write. our students can't write. They're, they're primarily nurse practitioners, and they're used to writing in incomplete sentences. So a complete sentence and a paragraph is a little scary to them. So writing was a huge problem. And we tried writing seminars and writing workshops, and nothing really seemed to work. So they actually have their own editor. So the students get five hours of editing time during the time that they're in the program. Now, five hours isn't much over two years. Most of them save their five hours for the final manuscript, and they know to get it in the best possible shape so that the five hours are used um, well. If they need more than five hours, then they're charged $90 an hour for editing time. So they, they very much learn how to do that. Um, they write the manuscript, they talk about that. Then they have to defend their capstone project. This is open to the public. Um, but because our students are distant, it's a little hard to have it open to the public. So they usually do it at their clinical site where they did the project, and they invite their um, friends, colleagues, to the final defense. And so they may be standing in a room doing the final defense, and we're on the phone or elsewhere in video contact with them doing the final defense of their project. And then all their friends leave, and the committee sits and decides whether they pass it or not. And then they graduate. Our graduation rate is 98%, which is really a high graduation rate. But we treat our students on the front end rather than on the other end. So we make sure that we believe that they're going to graduate on time. Um, we do have a few students that get pregnant, get divorced, that delays them a little bit. Um, but generally, we, I think we've had probably in the eight years, we've had three people that did not complete the program. Other than that, everybody completes the program, and pretty much everybody completes the program on time. So here's a question. How many capstone projects am I expected to chair or serve on at any one time? Is what we say is two. So everybody, PhD, DNP, as long as you're doctorally prepared, we expect you to serve on two if there's two available. If not, then on one. Does the capstone work count for, each, for teaching credit? So we, so we said, oh no, you're not going to get teaching credit for working. I shouldn't say capstone. It should be DNP project. The white paper changed that name, and I never updated the slide. We said, oh no, no, no. If you're chairing a DNP project, 
That's like advising. No, you're not going to get any teaching credit for that. And the number of faculty who wanted to um, be on capstones went down. So um, now we changed it to if you are chairing a capstone credit, you get one credit for the whole time. One credit, one teaching credit. Does that make sense? One teaching credit? So I like teaching a one credit course. Um, if you're a committee member, you don't. So everybody wants to be a capstone chair to get the one credit. And if you don't um, get the one credit, you can get $1,000. So it's one credit or $1,000. So we have, um, we have no problem getting capstone chairs. Let's just say that. And that's why they all come to the wine and cheese and sort of line up and say, choose me, choose me, because I would like to be that. The other thing is, <coughs> can yeah. you just elaborate a little bit on that? So one credit for the whole time? For the whole time. And how many credits do they normally teach? Okay, so, so how much does that relieve something? Yeah, okay, that's an excellent question. So sorry about that. So if you are tenure track at Duke, you teach nine credits a year. So it's like one course three times a year. If you are clinical track or non-tenure track, um, you teach 18 credits. So it's half. I mean, it's double that. Tenure track teaches half. So it doesn't relieve that much. But if you have, so I have chair of 13 capstones right now, which is way too many. But that gives me 13 teaching credits, so it works out. So what benefit do you get from all the work? So you can get, either get teaching credit reduction, you can get some money in your discretion, and this goes to a discretionary account, it's not paid to you, it's paid to an account which you can use for travel or scholarly activities. Because every manuscript must be submitted for publication, our publication rate is somewhere between 55 and 65 percent. So you've got a pretty good chance of getting your um, project published, which really helps you with promotion and tenure, or just promotion if you're non-tenure track. Do we have enough faculty to serve on capstone committees? Sure. We, don't. we personally do not have any problem with that. Barbara? Yeah. Um, just two questions. Yeah. The slide prior, you said that the defense is in front of their committee. Yes. And one for the clinical site. So they present at their clinical site or yes. one committee member from the clinical site? Oh, there is one committee member from the clinical site, but they present at their clinical site. As well. Yeah, so it could be a room like this. This okay. could be a, a defense. Yeah, that's and where their defense is. Not, it's not on campus. Okay, so the committee members go to their clinical site or, or they Skype in or whatever. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So typically it's a room like this and they've got all their friends cheering them on and the, the one person from the committee who's at the clinical site is there. The rest of us are on the phone. Okay, yeah. and then for the um, capstone, you faculty have a stipend and a teaching credit? Or, stipend or. for a teaching And the stipend credit. doesn't go directly to the faculty member, it goes to their like development fund or whatever yes. for travel, et cetera. Okay. Yes, yes. Which means it's not taxable. Mm -hmm. So you, if it's a thousand dollars, you get the full thousand dollars to use for travel or registration. Yeah. But if if you use one credit for three years, two years, two years, two years, because you do summer semesters. Yeah. Okay. But how much time does it take doing a capstone? It depends how bad a writer is. <laughs> but we've got an Sorry. editor, and you got a statistician. It really doesn't take us that much right, time. Right, but one credit, if you're teaching a three credit class, you're not going to get relief from a class. So one credit. No, but you can roll over those credits. So you can save them up until you have three and then get a release. Yeah. That has made the faculty really, really happy. That's the one thing that made the faculty happy. Okay, so. Um, <clears throat> How many capstone? Oh, I did that. What benefit do I get? Do we have enough faculty? So, do you have military students here, active duty military? Some. Some, Some. okay. So the problem with active duty military, and I'm retired military, is that you can't make them submit their manuscript to the, to the journal because it has to be cleared by PAO, Public Affairs Office in the military. You don't do that, you're in deep trouble. So we had to make an exception for military. They have to submit it to the Public Affairs Office for clearance because they want to make sure you don't say anything bad about the military. Um, and we just get email confirmation. If the manuscript is accepted but the student does not want to make revisions, the faculty member takes over as first author. We have a lot of manuscripts that are accepted with revisions. And guess what the student says? I'm done, I'm out of here. I don't give a rip about that. So 
that's a lot of work on everybody's part. So the student then signs a form that says, I give first authorship rights to whoever the capstone chair is, and the, the capstone chair can then submit it for publication. Does this happen a lot? No, this doesn't happen a lot. And I will give you an example. I am not a nurse anesthetist, but I had a nurse anesthesia person do a, um, a process improvement project, and it was accepted, and it just needed some revisions, but the revisions were the type that I didn't know the answer, I didn't have the content for that, and so it just didn't get turned around. Uh, and so that's one that didn't. So we have an over uh, 55 publication rate. It would be higher if this happened. It would be a lot higher if that happened. Or, Sir. Uh, just a remark, uh, I'm Tom Long. I provide writing support services. You do, that's I right. I met you before. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I've got an article coming out, a nurse, author, and editor, about the issue of revising and resubmitting and whether people do resubmit. And in the course of that, I polled the members of the International Academy of Nurse Editors. Uh, and one of the themes that came out, and I asked you, do you have people who uh, fail to revise and resubmit? And one of the themes that came out was a large number of uh, DMP students who are required to submit to journals as part of their process, but then never follow through on revision and resubmission, uh, which really irritates editors, journal nursing editors. Sure, because, because of all the time invested in, in uh, the revision, in the uh, mm -hmm. peer review process. But it sounds like you've, you've, you have a, an option here uh, that allows the major advisor to take over the manuscript if the student has not followed through. The student stays on the author line but does not, is not right. the first author. Right, right, right. Okay. And the student signs a form indicating, because we didn't want to have any problems later uh, on. Right. That okay. they are no longer first author. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Either as uh, first author or as co-author, uh, how does the PTR committee view the, you know, the student uh, uh, publications? Do they see those as, you know, counting in the same way as the faculty members, you know, in their, or, how, you know, how does that, how does that play out its value? Are you talking about promotion? Yes. Yeah, the terminology. Sorry, yeah, promotion and tenure. Promotion and perspective tenure. Perspective on the, the student articles. For non for non tenure track, it counts just like anything else. Counts like an article. For tenure track, it counts as an article clearly, but it doesn't count as their major focus area unless it happens to be in their major yeah, focus yeah. area. But it does count within the uh, article count. Okay. Absolutely. <coughs> Which is why tenure track pick up these students. They know they need another two articles. They've got enough within their sort of focus area, but they need a few more, so they pick up these. Yeah. So requiring the students to submit, if we didn't require, the, if we just suggested, so some schools across the country just suggest that the final manuscript be submitted to a journal. And you know what? It doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. Students are tired, and they're broke, and they just want to get out of the school. Um, the one thing that came up at the nurse editors meeting also was that there is one particular school out there that has all the students submit to the same journal on the same day. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. And so this editor knows when that pile is going to come and how, um, and the quality of what we heard was not very good. And so, um, and it sounds like you've done some things to really help with the quality, but that was the first time I'd heard that with this whole idea of doing it. It would seem to me that they shouldn't all be going to the same journal. No, no, no. Well, they would, it just doesn't make any sense if they would all I know, but the, the, when we heard, I heard that, I was just like, I couldn't even, she said she would get like 60, uh, 60 submissions on the same day. Because it checks the box. Of it checks the box. And you yeah. get some kind of email confirmation that you submitted it. Yeah, oh, that's terrible. And others, some schools are having students write very long papers similar to a dissertation, so it might be 80 pages, and submitting that to a journal, which of course is a journal. Yeah. So our students have to select the journal, they have to pick top three, list why they're going to do this, write the query letter, do all that kind of stuff. But the um, 
the manuscript for graduation has to be written according to journal guidelines, of course, the right length and those kinds of things. Um, but anyway, if there's any way we can move this, if we can solve this problem, our publication rate would be so much higher. I did bring a list of some of the published uh, manuscripts that are in the press, <coughs> if anyone wants to see those. So things we've learned. Uh, I'm moving off the DNP now more on online. We have had a couple of problems in the DNP program. One, when we first started eight years ago, we had no DNPs on faculty. So all we had were PhDs, and guess what they did? They taught like they were taught, right? And so when they tried to do the DNP projects, we said these are process improvement, quality improvement projects. They started looking more like dissertations. So we really had to spend a lot of time figuring out what is a quality improvement project and how to get away from these complicated research designs which are not appropriate for the DNP project. So our students have taught us a few things, um, and that is that we tend to, t we used to, used to, we've changed now, tend to teach passively. We have a faculty fact fetish. I can't say that fast well. Um, we all recognize that students have a learning curve, but we forget that we have a forgetting curve. And with SPSS, we have not figured out how to do that. They have SPSS the first semester, they're actually using it on their projects a year later, and they have really forgotten it because they haven't had to use it. So in the data mining course, we now are reintroducing them to SPSS, and they have to use it there to be more familiar with it. Our students want inductive reasoning over facts. They want interaction, and they want immediate feedback. I'm sure you've seen that. I see that in my paper at midnight, it's 2 a.m. How come it's not back yet? What's up with you? So they are really, um, really different kinds of students. They want just-in-time learning, and most of all, they want to learn when they want to learn, and they want to use technology. So we have seen the shift from students as consumers to students as creators, and we have tried to change our curriculum so that when they are on campus, they are doing a lot of more creative kinds of things. <clears throat> Remember, there's no longer the sage on the stage. We're now all guides on the sides. And our classrooms have really changed at Duke. We used to have classrooms that were like that, where I'm the sage on the stage. Our classrooms are now round tables with computer screens all over the classroom so that when they're working on problem solving, they're sitting their round table in front of a computer screen and really solving problems. Students have really liked that. Um, you've seen this cell phones for note taking? I just love this. That was way beyond what I do. Um, but they value FaceTime. So we have asked the students, how often in the DMP program do you want to be on campus? They want to be on campus two to three times a semester. We only have them there once a semester. So they want to be there as often as possible yet as infrequently as possible because of the cost of the airfare and the hotels. So we've settled on once a semester, but we try to make the once a semester really valuable with this small group work um, with faculty. Um, so how do you engage students in an online environment? I'm sure you've done some of this. We have students and faculty introduce themselves with videos. So they take a small video of themselves and post it. So the faculty get a sense of who is this distant learner. And the faculty do the same thing. We have weekly online voice introduction of the lessons. You know, this week we're going to be learning about and you know, pay attention to this and that. Um, and then faculty feedback with voice on assignments. Have you used that? Um, this is where you are, have a paper and you're using track changes, but you can put voice over it. The introduction is very strong. You can see my notes on this. I suggest you work more on this and this. That has been very helpful, and the students really like that because sometimes they get confused just by all the track changes. So how do you facilitate group work across time zones with people that work full time? This has been a struggle for us because we're doing Singapore to Switzerland and everything in between. And we've established Duke time. So we're on the East Coast like you are, so all appointments online are made on Duke time, whether you're in Singapore or Saudi Arabia, because the time zones get very confusing. 
Um, we use Trello. Have you ever used Trello? It's a whiteboard that students can pin up things on. They can post notes or they can pin up pictures or ideas or diagrams. We use Dropbox. Have you used Dropbox for documents? Yeah, that works really well. Skype, EndNotes. EndNotes is also good for reference sharing. We sort of like that. And uh, we like video and voice conferencing via WebEx. A lot of our students work in groups um, to give feedback to each other. <laughs> Isn't this true? <laughs> so they love and need group work, but they love and hate group work at the same time. Um, and I love this tweet um, from someone. <laughs> uh, I'm going to share with you something that uh, we use called VenueGen. We were a beta test site, so this ends up being funny in the end. Uh, it's a way to do 3D virtual meetings. Uh, there's avatars, but these avatars are not like, um, what was the other avatars? Second Life. Second Life. These are not like Second Life. Um, because these avatars, you upload a picture of yourself, and they have facial expressions and movements. You can clap, you can raise your head, you can say someone's crazy. You can do all those kinds of things, which are really nice. <coughs> and there are different kinds of venues that you can have. Uh, all you need is the software, uh, headset, and a microphone. And you can upload and share documents. This is what we use it for. Um, and there's live web surfing available. So we held the first virtual poster session in the nation, which actually worked out real well. That's supposed to meet me, the one with the sort of reddish hair over there. Um, <laughs> and you could ask questions of the presenters. You could walk in and out of the different poster sessions. But that's not what I'm going to show you. What I'm going to show you is team meetings. So you can get your whole committee and the student together. You can um, share documents. Um, that's the person who's talking. I know the person who's talking has a uh, name above them, so you're not miscalling someone. You know exactly who it is. I'm standing back here, so this is a team that's talking uh, about a particular topic. Now I want you to pay attention to the girl in turquoise. Is that turquoise? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's a man. There's a, a girl in turquoise, and there's a lady in brown. Right? Man, girl in turquoise, and lady in brown. So this is, um, this is a beta test, so you know that something's going to go wrong. And here's what the problem with the beta test site is. Man, <laughs> naked lady. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody is in shock when this comes up. All of a sudden she loses her clothes. And <laughs> I actually presented this at a national conference. I was presenting the, the way you, I was presenting how you can cooperate, but everybody was focusing on this. And so the question at the conference became, do you tell the lady that the lady's naked? Do you tell her? Do you say, oh, guess what? You lost your clothes. Because she didn't know she had lost her clothes. On her screen, she looked perfectly normal. And on the man's screen, she looked perfectly normal. So we ended up, yeah? Um, I have a considerable amount of Second Life experience. Yeah. So I know You should say, guess what? Um, it looks like you lost your clothes. Well, sometimes you can just send them a little private text. Private text, text. Yeah. 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 So we do like this for meetings of committee members. It works really well for us. What else do I have? Um, has your library gone to virtual rather than uh, hard, hard building? You still have a library library? Yeah. yeah. Okay, ours got turned into a faculty center, and there are a few floors that are still library, but generally everything is virtual now. Um, have you used Smart Search? 
which searches all ebooks available. Okay, you have done that. Um, Trello, we talked about. The one that I like now for students is do you have Ultrametric? Ultrametric looks at consumer traffic and it looks at that social media traffic on articles that you wrote, which is really interesting. Um, and it pins where the geographic location of your readers are. Um, so uh, I was just in China, and um, this is someone that China is very familiar with, one of these authors. And so we uh, pulled up his article, and we know that there's 697 people that have been looking at it. But what's really interesting, and I'm not sure if this will show up, is how many people are tweeting it, how many people, are, and it tells you where the people are from. You can see they're mostly from the United States. And it tells you whether they're members of the public or scientists. And this is mostly members of the public and whether they're practitioners and science communicators. So that's been very helpful for our students to look at the traction that social media has gotten on the different articles that they're looking at. So it's like ResearchGate, but for yes. link. Yes. So that's what I've got. What questions do you have for me? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Carol? Do the do your PhD students have the same requirement of the manuscript submission as the DMP students do? They have a three series manuscript submission. So they submit three articles uh, and combine so they, together. That, that's what they do for their dissertation. They Correct. don't do the traditional five. They check. do not do the traditional because a lot of those don't get published. So they did the three manuscripts combined together to be the dissertation. Thank yeah. you. Both degrees that do come from the graduate school? Actually, they do not at Duke. The PhD comes from the graduate school, the DNP comes from the School of Nursing, but the other schools I've looked at, they come from the graduate school, both the DNP and the PhD. However, however, California, the California system had a little bit of problem understanding the DNP degree as a practice doctorate, and therefore, they had to figure out that they had to modify their handbook because their handbook talked about dissertation, dissertation, and what is required. So they modified that. Texas did the same thing. They modified it so that it would work. But that's that's work that has to be done ahead of time or while you're doing it. Yeah. Could you discuss? And, and this is where I'm having some trouble following. Could you discuss the difference between? Um, when we look at ANCC and their white paper and their guidelines, and then we look at CCNE, which is quite different Correct. than what ANCC is saying. I mean, the white paper guidelines is where we think we should be going. But when we go for accreditation, we, we're accredited by CCNE. Could you discuss how they interrelate or don't at all? What, where, where is your sticking point in the two documents? It's not that it's a sticking point, is, is if we are accredited by, and this is what I'm trying to figure out, if we're accredited by CCNE, we're following what CCNE wants, right. we're meeting on, we sailed through that stuff with these um, words, we did really good with our CCNE uh -huh. accreditation. Uh -huh. So as we look at how we did through that, and now we look at this, this new ANCC white paper, how is CCNE looking at that white paper? I, have, I do not know the answer to that question. What I do know is that the white paper from CCNE was trying to get at the ANCC. No, ACN. Yeah, ACN was trying to get at the variation in final products on DMP. So I know some schools in which the final project was a book report. That was your DMP project. And some schools, it was a review of the literature. Um, Texas Christian University, I talked with that dean last week, their final project was a review of the literature. And they have said no, that it must be an implementation project, which we have been doing all along, thank goodness. So we were in line with that. So I don't know about the other one, ANCC. No, she no I, meant a, I meant ANCC. I meant oh, you meant ANCC. I meant ANCC. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep. So, so if we're if we got accredited and our accreditation was good, yep. it was very good. Actually, we got the most the, yep. the five years that yep. we could have gotten. I would hope so, sure. But this is changes now. 
this white paper has changes. It tries to clarify the variation in programs across the country. That's what it tries to do. But how is this, the AACN white paper, related to accreditation? It is related to accreditation. So I think we will be following those guidelines for accreditation, and that's why we changed our program. So we no longer call it a capstone. We call it DMP Scholarly Project. Everything else we were fine with, we were in line with. But when I'm reviewing other programs, I bring that with me and say, are you, are you, are you? I think, yeah. I think part of the disconnect is, in fact, the CCNE criteria does not relate to the white paper. It, there has been no discussion by CCNE to change the, the standards. At so this that, point in time, that's you're correct. absolutely right. That is correct. I think there was some really helpful stuff in, in the there. right table mm -hmm. that you know that provides some clarification but i think the intent was as you said to ensure the floor and not the ceiling and i think that that we just you know and again our degrees come from the graduate yeah board, yeah um which was deliberate um and so i think that there's as we go forward and, and we seek to kind of find what parts we're going to shore up and, and that sort of thing i think there's just concern about <coughs> overcorrection and overreaction oh. to, you know, something that's not broken. Um, and so we just want to make sure, I think, that our program, that sailed through CCNE, that it doesn't have any unanticipated mm -hmm. problems because it's sort of like if you change everything that's in a course, but you're going to give the same final exam, there's a little disconnect. So I think we're just, as a faculty, just want to make sure that mm -hmm. we're delivered. I'm recommending that programs look at that and see where they are out of compliance and can they come into compliance. With Other questions for me? Yes, ma'am. One of the questions I was wondering about, you have this really terrific incentive program for people who are going to um, serve as chairs for the DMP students. Is it the same for PhD? Yes, it is the same for PhD. <laughs> You're welcome. Postcard from Ivy. So, jumping off of Sandy's um, comment and Denise's question, I feel like this is an opportunity with your expertise here for us to look at our program around where the really strengths are and think about if there is anything we want to shift or change to align a little bit better. How do we do that without losing what we think works really, really well? Right, so you always keep the strengths clearly keep the strengths and then see if there needs to be shy, slight shifts in what you're doing. I don't know your program well enough to know what that is, but I'm happy to talk about what I've seen in other programs as well as our experience, um, however you want to handle that. And are you going to have a little task force that will work on that or what is the plan? We haven't finalized or formalized that, but I, I could imagine something like that being what's going forward. So it might be good for those of us that are going to talk with you again tomorrow morning. Yeah to maybe spend some time today and driving and stuff, thinking about what do we think are our greatest strengths right. and kind of talk with you about that tomorrow. And right. um, I think one of the things that you know we're hearing reflections about is that our students currently do a clinical practice dissertation. Uh -huh. And terminology is important, so we might want to think about that. Yeah. But some of their projects do turn into a little bit of research projects. That's not necessarily a bad thing. But how does that look? Do we need to help them shift to a different direction or not? And of course, we don't want to hold anybody back. If they come with an idea of what they really want to try to implement down the road, but there's not research and literature in the background to say, yes, it's going to work or not, a pilot makes a lot of sense. So you know, maybe we can kind of yeah. have a little conversation Happy tomorrow to about, about that. how that would fit in or not and, mm -hmm. and um, you know what we can encourage our students to do without creating unnecessary drama. And I think the notion of having the committee approve something and then have the program committee kind of review things. And, you know, I'm, I'm of two minds, because part of me thinks like, okay, so now we've done it twice. But to sort of back the committee up when it's too much or not enough, that's a nice checks and balance too. So I myself would like to have a little more conversation about how that's worked and, you know, examples that you might have of yeah. when it's crashed and burned and when it's worked really well and, you know, how we might replicate the worked really well part. It also. worked really, really well in the beginning because people were going down the research route, and so we had to bring them back. I'm not sure it's necessary now, but our committee still wants to do it. Mm -hmm. And the white paper recommends it. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So 
we're going to continue to do it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Any other questions we have? You talked to me previously about schools that um, had their degree awarded by the graduate mm -hmm. school and we're moving in this direction in the DMP Scholar product. Yeah. Could you just talk, share what you shared with me with the group? It, um, okay, what we've had to do wasn't our school, it was other schools I've worked with. We had to talk with the graduate school about what is a professional doctorate, what is a, a practice doctorate. And they didn't get it, to be very honest. It took them a while to figure it out, especially if it was the first professional doctorate on campus. So their criteria were you need to do this, 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 and this, and particularly everything was about the dissertation. And so we had to work with them on what is a practice improvement project and how is that different than a dissertation. It also went so far as the graduate school at one place was <coughs> awarding the PhD and they wore one academic regalia and the DNP were a less than academic regalia. Do you understand what I'm saying? So if the PhD had their logo or something on the um, regalia, the DNPs were black with the three black stripes and the apricot hood. Um, so we got them to change over to, it's a degree of the graduate school, they would wear the same academic regalia that PhDs would wear, but the hood would be different. So it is a process of getting them to understand what is a practice doctorate, particularly if they don't have other practice doctorates there. So we just went through the graduate handbook and the requirements for graduation and said dissertation or scholarly project as defined by the, um, the School of Nursing. And, and that seemed to work just fine. Um, but you can't just go in and say we're going to do it. It really is a process of working. Just like we had to work through the IRB, that was us personally, we had to work through the IRB. We've just got to talk to people to help them understand. Is this the only practice doctorate on campus? No. no. Oh, so you're well used to this. <clears throat> yeah, so I serve on the Graduate Faculty Council and have the group that makes um, the votes and decisions about the yeah. catalog where all those kinds of things yeah. are listed. And we have um, DRPH, we have PT, Oh, you know, all, several different sort of, you know, healthcare professions that have practice-focused doctoral um, degrees, and I'm, we just made some significant changes in the handbook last year because some of the master's programs weren't meeting what was written in the handbook because, you know, the program had evolved and needed to have a different need, and there was no problem with changing those. So I'm, oh, good. I'm fairly confident that the so, graduate school would be really supportive if we need to do language changes. Perfect. I'm not sure we do. I have to go back and reread some sections. I would. I and mean, look at it through the framework of the DNP. Yeah. Would this work? Would this work? Would yeah. this work? Yeah. Yeah. And do you have electives that students can take? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. And other schools, too. Yes, and other schools, too. Okay, good. Good, good, good. What other questions do you have for me? Yeah, it's me. Uh, could you just discuss, have you always been online? Did you always start online? Uh, for the DNB? Yes. We started online because our market survey indicated that students were not able to come to, first of all, we're a national university, so they'd have to move to Duke, and they couldn't give up their jobs and their families to move to Duke. So it's always been online. We started online and we stay online. But they do have the on-campus sessions that they come to. That's what we are, we've been trying, we've been talking about that more and more because our, our numbers are, certainly aren't as high as yours um, and we think that's probably one of the problems is we're just getting the people that are a bit closer to the area. I mean, we are spreading out a little bit more now, but. I bet you were online. Yeah. We are or we're not. It, it's complicated because the, the university has a design, we've done online, we're primarily online, but we're not university sanctioned as an online program. And one of the reasons we wanted to do that is because the way that our organization is set up is that going online through the university channels provides uh, two really important things outside of instructional design and things like that. One is that it provides marketing money so that you can market your program. Because right now we have no marketing money whatsoever. So it provides that, you can get Google Ads and things like that. Which, and the more important thing that it does is that it takes tuition, which is currently cost, pre 
prohibited at the moment for out-of-state students, and it makes it far more affordable. Um, so that is would actually be as big of a payoff, if not more, than going just having the money for Google ads and advertising and things like that. So right now we have no advertising at all, and we have tuition that is cost prohibitive and not competitive or able to draw students from outside of Connecticut. Because I looked at your website, it looked online. It, it's online, but, but it pre-existed the current channel to, to create, because we were online since 2008, 2009, but the, the mechanism for which to do this didn't come about until far more recently. I see. That. Most DMP programs are online mm -hmm. with some on-campus requirements, yeah. Because you, the average age of our student is 38. Do you know what? It's probably older than that. You're older than that. Our started older, started at 49 and has come down to 38. Yeah. I mean, what, what you can do is, because we just did this with our neonatal program. The neonatal program was having tremendous difficulty recruiting because to come for a two-year program was $90,000. And now the cost of the entire program is 33. Oh my gosh. That makes a huge difference. And to miss, you know, a very obvious organizational structure piece like that, um, that can do wonders for yeah. your, for your, yeah. your And importantly, when we work through eCampus, yeah. that money that's fee-based has the option of coming to the school Correct. and send it to the university at large. So that's helped us a great deal. Whether yeah. or not we could negotiate that also with the DNP program, we have to sort out. Okay. Right. <clears throat> um, I had a, a question too. The avatars. Yeah. Meetings, are those sort of in place of the second and third in-person meetings on campus, or do you have like weekly sessions where everyone has to be at Duke time, or how does that work? It depends on the committee, but the committee uses this if they want to get together just I to see. discuss some issues. So maybe the student has submitted a draft, and people have read the draft, but they really want to talk with the students, so they'll just come into that kind of a venue, and it's maybe a half an hour and they're done. They could use it for their defense if they wanted to. Most people want to be filmed, okay. and so we're looking at them uh, real time. So it's not part of class work or like required certain time of the year meetings or whatever. It's available to make meeting virtually in person easier. Correct. Okay. Correct. And when they're in their um, their scholarly project, they, that is a credit bearing course and it is working with the committee members, and there are established deliverables at the end of each of the semesters, if you want to graduate on time, yeah. And we really want students to get out of the program. We don't want any linger honors. We want them to get, to get out. And how long do students have to complete the DMP? They have technically seven years, because that's what's provided. Because it's graduate, graduate school. school. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. What other questions do you have for me? If not, thank you for attending and letting me take your time. I'll just turn it back over to Jackie for the rest of the agenda. Thank you, Barbara. Yes, you're welcome. Barbara will be with us again tomorrow morning in an open forum. All of you are welcome to attend that. We scheduled it tomorrow morning because we have some key faculty who really wanted to be here today but couldn't, and that was the time that worked for them. Um, so that they could have some time to talk with Barbara, but all of you are also welcome um, tomorrow morning. Um, the minutes, are there any discussion of the minutes or any concerns that we need to address with the minutes from last graduate faculty meeting? No. Do I have a, a vote? Approved? Second. All say, all aye? Aye. 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 Okay. <laughs> um, Sandy, do you want to discuss the neonatal CNS? Yeah, just briefly, just more of an FYI for everyone. Um, for a number of years now, we've been in the neonatal practice and the only um, option for um, clinical nurse specialists or a nurse practitioner. Uh, but there have been some changes over the summer and over the last couple of years that have really caused a lot of problems. They came up, the National Association of CNSs came out over the summer, put out a white paper that basically says if you're going to be running a CNS program, then you have to now be certified as a CNS. They didn't used to have that, so Regina and I were able to, to run a program. Now they're saying you need to have one of these folks in here. There are, in fact, only 11 board certified at least so the likelihood that you're going to find one of those people to come here, or how do you have an online program and students all over the country and be able to actually find and match a preceptor, 
which really it breaks my heart because I get at least three or four a week inquiries about the CNS option. But when I just met with my cohorts in Dallas last month, there have only been eight programs left nationally. There's only one. Everyone else I talked to um, a month ago said, we just can't do this. There's just not enough CNS people. There's not enough preceptors. We have to put it on hiatus. And so I think um, because I don't have a choice, I just wanted you all to know that that was going on. And I'm going to have to talk with the eCampus folks to take that option out of all of our marketing materials um, because it's just not feasible. And I think that the cost of bringing such a person in, which technically you could do because it's online, but I don't think it's going it's to be feasible. So I would make a move to, to put it on hiatus and that kind of thing. So, so we retain the ability to offer it again at some point, but yet we're not yeah. actively. Just like the, uh, we've, we've done that with a couple yeah. of other things, rather than like just the take it away completely, because then the process yeah. of having to reactivate it is really a problem. So, yeah. So you've moved, you've moved that formally. Yes, that's come up through um, grad track. That's from grad track. Oh, yes. uh, from grad track. Okay, yeah. so it doesn't even second. Okay. Yeah. Any other discussions? Oh, discussion? So that's because they need a. You can't just consult or not. You need a preceptor. You need a preceptor like you do for anything yeah. else, and, yeah. and they're yeah. just not there. Mm -hmm. Do we need to vote on this? I Mr. think Robert so. Rose, I, yeah. think so. Yeah. <laughs> I think we do because it has to go through yeah. here so that we can take it so out of the cabinet. Yeah. Yeah. So since it came from grad track, we don't need to have a so second or anything. Second. We just need to just vote, vote on this. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Any abstentions? All right. All approved. Um, we also have three... Um, uh, course and curriculum worksheets that Ivy brought forward, so I'll let you handle those. Those are from Grad Track and, and, or CNC technically, and um, I don't think Paul is here, so I'll present them. We had um, put in some prerequisites in a course that both the FNP students and the AGNP students take. The course that goes along with it, this is a didactic clinical course, and the matching course is a clinical seminar course. And the FNP students take one, and the AGNP students take one. They are two different courses. So we couldn't put those prerequisites in the combined course because the registrar's program can't say if for this, yes, and if for that, no. So we moved the prerequisites to the clinical seminar course so that the AGNP prerequisites match with their course and the FNP prerequisites match with their course. Same prerequisites at the end of the day, but now in a place that the registrar system can match up to. And it has things like that clinical seminar has to be taken concurrently with the didactic course, and that group of courses can only be taken within six months of the prior course. Questions? Concerns? Since that came from grad track, we just need to vote. Can we vote as a group? Does everyone have any problem with voting on all three as a group? Just making sure. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Any abstentions? All right. That goes on to that. And I think that um, concludes our agenda, unless there were any other points to discuss. Did you finish a little early? <coughs> All right. Thank you.